We're so pleased today to welcome Mr. David Brooks, this year's keynote speaker. Dave Brooks is the op-ed columnist for the New York Times. He appears frequently as a commentator on TV and radio on shows such as The News Hour with Jim Lear and NPR's All Things Considered. He's written for numerous national publications, including The Weekly Standard, Newsweek, The Atlantic Monthly, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal. His, he is a frequent author, and his last book, The Social Animal, The Hidden Success, Sources of Love, Character, and Achievement, has been a great hit. Mr. Brooks has received rave reviews for his honest, insightful, humorous, and sometimes controversial observations on politics, culture, and our American way of life. He is widely read and often quoted by politicians and policymakers alike. Although Mr. Brooks lives in Washington, D.C., he has roots in Chicago. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Chicago, and he worked as a police reporter at the famous, and some would say infamous, City News Bureau of Chicago. In line with our strategic directions, Mr. Brooks is a vocal and passionate advocate for making college more affordable and accessible, increasing the number of students who finish and graduate from a college. And, current, and, and he always encourages the special bond between students and faculty. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Mr. David Brooks. Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Dr. Ender. You know, they say the American dream is a home, buying a home, but it's really getting a degree. And you guys have achieved the first stage of the American dream here today. Now, as I look out on this audience, the first thing I realize is some of you may not have graduated from college before, and you may not know the etiquette. It's customary when you come to get your degree to give the president a little tip uh, 10 or 20 bucks just to show he did a good job. It's also custom customary to give the commencement speaker a little something. No more than 15 or 20 percent of your annual tuition. Uh, now this money is not for me. It's going straight to the Ken Ender for President campaign. This country has a long leadership gap that only Dr. Ender can fill. Now, even if you don't give, I want you to know how great it is to be here on this happy occasion. The parents are happy to have produced such outstanding young men and women. The faculty is happy to have produced such outstanding graduates, despite everything the parents tried to do to them. The administrators are happy to have such outstanding alumni, despite everything the faculty tried to do to them. The students are happy to have turned out so well, despite what the blowhards in all these categories tried to do to them. Well, class of 2012, I am the final blowhard. I am the last windbag between you and your degree. <laughs> so on this happy occasion, and since I'm here in Illinois, I hope you don't mind if I start with a little story about Abraham Lincoln. When Lincoln was a boy, he had a little boat, which he kept on the Ohio River. One day, a pair of travelers asked him if he would row them to the middle of the boat, where they could catch a steamboat. Lincoln took them out, and as they boarded the steamboat, they each threw a little half dollar coin into the bottom of his little rowboat. He later recalled, you may think it was a very little thing, but it was a most important incident in my life. I could scarcely believe that I, a poor boy, had earned a dollar in less than a day. The world seemed wider and fairer before me. Now I hope that earning a degree today makes the world seems wider and fairer before you. And I hope you see that all the work and trouble you've put in has led to this important step today, and this step is one of many important steps you're going to take in the years ahead. And I hope you don't mind if I use my time today to clear up some bad advice that people in your shoes are usually given. The first bit of adva bad advice that's normally made on this occasion is that you should follow in your passion and dream big dreams. Now, if you're like me in your 20s, or like most people, <laughs> you don't know what your passions are, and you don't know what your big dreams are, and you're not quite sure yet where you fit in in the world. 
And so the better advice is don't look inside yourself for your passions. Look around the world to see what jobs and questions you can help solve. In 1940s, there was a guy named Viktor Frankl who was growing up in Europe, and he was put in a Nazi, a Nazi concentration camp. And he said to himself, hey, this wasn't the life I would have chosen, but this is the life that came to me. And so he became a psychologist studying pain. And he later wrote, don't ask what do I want from life, ask what is life asking of me? What opportunities and jobs do these circumstances put in front of me for me to do? The second bit of advice is that you shouldn't try to be a shooting star. You shouldn't try to burst into success all at once. Now this is the, the message that shows like American Idol and all those contest show offers, that success is gonna come to you overnight. This is the message of all the rap songs where the singer brags about how fast he blew up and how many records he sold. It's the message of reality TV. It was the message this week of a Facebook IPO in which some guy can get $19 billion by the time he's 30. And these messages have had their effect. According to one student, 80% of college students think they'll achieve their career goals in 10 years or less. 75% believe they'll be millionaires and half expect to be millionaires by age 50. Unless your name is LeBron James or Mark Zuckerberg or Nas or Drake, you probably won't be a millionaire by the time you're 30. Like most of us, you'll be a grinder. You'll get up and you'll work every day and then you'll get up and you'll work the next day. And your progress will come very gradually, step by step, decade by decade. Abraham Lincoln was a grinder. He worked slowly and remorselessly, and he hadn't really achieved anything spectacular by the time he was 40, but he was slowly building the skills that he needed to become one of the greatest Americans ever. Dwight Eisenhower was a grinder. He was stuck in the same rank in the Army for nearly two decades, but he was slowly building the character he would need to become one of our greatest generals. Now these people are slowly building strengths and talents that lead to great accomplishment and make for great people. And so let me put it this way, you can divide your virtues into two categories. On the one hand, there are things you might call the blooming virtues. These are the virtues that happen when you're young, and they're the virtues that got you to where you are today. And these are things like intelligence, energy, curiosity, charm, and humor. And those are things you had or, or you wouldn't be here. But then there are what you might call the ripening virtues. These are the virtues that develop slowly and which will build in you over the next many years. And these are the virtues that really lead to character and success. The ripening virtues include, include things like self-control so you can do the right thing even when you're tempted to do the wrong thing. They include things like knowing how to learn from failure and how to survive the death of someone you love. They include knowing yourself and others well enough to know who you should befriend who you should fall in love with, and who you should marry. And they include being brave enough, when you do get married or if you are married, to let the people who are closest to you deep into your life and to be vulnerable in front of them. And these ripening virtues, which are the most important ones, they only develop slowly, but they're the ones that really matter. One of these ripening virtues, a tremendously important one, is self-discipline. Now I know I'm a middle-aged guy, but the older I get, the more I realize that being well-organized is really important. When I was young, I had a messy desk and a messy room, and I spent most of my lo life looking for my keys. I thought being organized was a sign you were boring and repressed and kind of anal. But now I realize that discipline and organization is the key to everything. And one of my favorite management gurus is a guy named Jim Collins. He wrote books like Good to Great and Great by Choice, and he spent his life asking this question, who really makes it in this world? And he discovered the people who really leave a mark on the world are not necessarily the super talented ones or the super flamboyant ones. They're not the people with the perfect grades or the high SAT scores. Collins looked at the people who succeed, and he asked other people to describe them. And here's what he wrote. Throughout our research, we were struck by the continual use of words like disciplined, rigorous, 
dogged, determined, diligent, precise, fastidious, systematic, methodical, demanding, consistent, focused, and accountable. These aren't the sexy traits, they're not the exciting traits, they're not the ones that get celebrated on movies and TV, but these are the ripening virtues that really lead to accomplishment. In one book, Collins described two explorers who in 1899 tried to be the first person to reach the South Pole. One of them was a guy named Roel Amundsen. He trained rigorously for this expedition. He biked from Norway to Spain to build up his leg muscles. He lived with some Eskimos for months to learn how they adapted to the cold. He noticed that Eskimos never hurry through the snow. They move slowly and deliberately. They wear loose-fitting clothes to help the sweat evaporate when they're exerting themselves. Amon learned how to kill and eat a dolphin, just in case he got shipwrecked and he needed to eat dolphin to survive. Another guy, Robert Scott, could have done all that boring preparation, but he was a little more daring. And he thought it would be faster to use horses to get through Antarctica, not dogs, the way Amundsen did. But because he didn't do preparation, Scott didn't realize that horses sweat on the outside. And in conditions that cold, their bodies get coated with ice. He also didn't stop to think that horses eat grass. There's not a lot of grass in Antarctica. Amundsen prepared his route by putting 20 supply depots along the way. And he marked them with black flags on high bamboo poles that wouldn't get covered with snow. Scott had one supply depot marked by a single flag. Amundsen worried that he might get lost, so he bought three tons of supplies for five men. Scott was confident he could get to the pole and back on schedule, so he brought one ton of supply for 17 men. In short, Amundsen did the boring thing and prepared for failure. He prepared for the worst, and he diligently prepared for all the bad things that might happen. Scott raced ahead, confident in his own plans. Amundsen successfully reached the pole and came back a hero. Scott reached the pole and found Amundsen's flag already there. And Scott and his party died on the way back. In exploring and in life, discipline actually does work. Productive paranoia works, preparing for failure, and grinding works. Now to me and to Collins, the most impressive thing about Amundsen was how he organized his walking. He traveled 20 miles a day. When the weather was good and he was tempted to go further, but he said, no, we're gonna stop at 20 miles. When the weather was bad, he wanted to stop earlier, but he said, no, we're gonna go 20 miles. Every day, 20 miles, regular as clockwork. And that's a good metaphor of what a successful life is like, whether you're working at a plant or raising kids or working at a travel agency, Every day you put in your 20 miles. Collins's general point is that the people who do really well on this earth combine two traits that are in tension with each other, extreme personal humility and extreme personal willpower. They understand their weaknesses and they prepare for them, but they push ahead rel relentlessly 20 miles day after day. Now late last year I asked readers of my newspaper column who were over 70, to look back on their lives and report to me how they'd done in life, what they'd learned from life, and what grade they would give themselves for their life. One of the interesting things is that most people gave themselves pretty high grades for their careers, generally an A minus. Most, the, most people gave themselves lower grades for their personal and family lives, a lot of B minuses and C pluses. Most people regretted the things they didn't do very few regretted the things they did do. For most people, it took a long time to realize you can't change other people. You have to accept them as they are. But the best essays were written by people who just grinded away through life. Maybe they didn't start out fast, but they just kept doing that 20 mile hike day after day. One woman who wrote to me was a woman named Regina Titus. She grew up shy and sheltered in Long Island, New York. She didn't go to college, she took some clerical jobs at first, and she worked with people who treated her poorly. Her first husband died after six months of marriage. Her second husband committed suicide. But she just kept grinding. At age 56, studying nights and weekends, 
she obtained a college degree, cum laude, from Marymount Manhattan College. She moved to Wilmington, Delaware, and now she's in her 70s. She leads tours of local museums. She studies opera. She leads hikes. She volunteers and does a thousand other things. She wrote to me, I did not have the joy of holding a baby in my arms. I did not have a long and happy marriage. But every day she kept growing, and now she leads a large and happy life. And so the lesson is maturity comes slowly, the real progress comes slowly, and even affluence comes slowly. Money destroys you if it drops down fast on you like a blizzard. Money doesn't destroy you if it settles down gradually like a mist. Now when I look back on how my own lifestyle has changed in terms of money, I realize one of the most important things happened when I crossed the orange juice line. Just after I graduated from college, I had no money at all, and I couldn't afford to buy orange juice in the supermarket. But after a certain point in my career, I had a steady income, and I could buy orange juice without worrying about it. And I confess, even today in the supermarket, I feel a high degree of satisfaction when I put a carton of orange juice in my cart. The chief pleasure of making money is that you can buy orange juice without thinking about it. You can think less about money and more about other stuff. After buying the orange juice, money hasn't really added that much. So in this talk, I've tried to emphasize the importance of the ripening virtues over the blooming virtues. I've tried to emphasize the importance of discipline, steadiness, organizations, and all those boring and anal traits. And I've tried to emphasize the 20 mile hike day after day. And I've spoken mostly about professional life, but I wanna end a bit by talking about personal life, which is more important. Over the last few years, we've learned a lot about happiness. We've learned that the relationship between money and happiness is weak. Once you hit being middle class, getting richer doesn't make you any happier. We've learned there's a relationship between age and happiness. People in their 20s are, tend to be pretty happy. Then happiness levels begin to dip down into middle age. And most people bottom out and are at their most unhappy at age 47. And that's called having middle, teenage children. <laughs> but then it goes up again. And people are at their happiness between 65 and 75 in the 10 years after retirement. But the strongest relationship between happiness is between happiness and relationships. Joining a social club that meets just once a month produces the same happiness gain as doubling your income. The daily activity that contributes most to happiness is having dinner with friends. The daily activity that detracts most from happiness is commuting. And the biggest relationship between happiness is between happiness and love. If you're around people you love, you'll be happy. If not, you won't be. If you have a great career and a crappy marriage, you will be unhappy. If you have a crappy career but a great marriage, you will be happy. Now the people who know most about marriage emphasize it like everything else is a grind. It's a series of 20 mile hikes every day. And I recently came across a very smart blog post by a woman named Lydia Netzer on how to stay married. Some of her advice is kind of counterintuitive, but I thought it was smart. For example, one lesson she said is, go to bed mad. The conventional advice is that couples should never go to bed angry. But Netzer argues, sometimes you just need some sleep. Wake up, make some pancakes, you'll feel better about it. Another bit of Netzer's advice is brag about the person you love. Go around bragging about them. Let them hear you bragging about them. Very good advice. Another is, don't think temporarily. Don't say to yourself, if he does this to me, it's over between us. Operate under the assumption that it will never be over. It's the two of you against the world forever and ever. There's no if and then. There's no hypothetical divorce in the back of your mind. It's just forever. Another bit of advice is to make a pact with your friends. You will listen to them bitch about their spouses. You will share their anger and frustration. But after the bitching and moaning, you will still know their spouse is the greatest thing ever. 
you will wipe the slate clean. You make this pact because you want to be able to vent to your friends without your friends ever hating your spouse. I recommend Googling Netzer and finding her advice. There's a lot more, and I thought it was very smart. And so you know already, and if you don't know, you'll find out. Life is hard, and it takes resilience and toughness. It's a slow, steady grind. But if you do the grind, every day you get these wonderful moments. Some of the moments are wonderful like today. Big occasions with formal ceremonies with a large audience, and everybody can see what you've accomplished, and everybody can feel happy and proud. Some of the wonderful moments happen when you aren't even thinking about them, when you're out playing softball or having dinner with your friends. Some of the wonderful moments are actually quite hard. When you've learned how to fix an engine or make a sale or you're in the middle of a job and you're using your skills to the highest. Some of them are as trivial as picking up a carton of orange juice in the grocery store. And I'm really happy you let me share this happy day with you. And I have every confidence you'll go forth like Lincoln to a fair and open world. And I have every confidence that you'll grind it out year upon year, 20 miles, day upon day. Thanks very much.